All right, so good evening. Um, had a little technical hiccup, but we are moving into introduction to top 21, which is chapter one of the book. Um, I had planned on doing this discussion, but uh, in the interest of time, we're gonna skip that for now, because you guys did a great job with the earlier discussion, uh, which was not recorded. This is being recorded. And let's start off with this video and then we'll move into the chapter topics. Addiction. It could care less. About the color of my skin. Whether I'm young or old. Rich or poor. Gay or straight. Shy or popular. Addiction is a chronic disease. That can. And does. Affect all walks of life. All types of people. White collar workers. Inner city youth. The elderly. Even unborn babies. Addiction is a family killer. A job wrecker. A life destroyer. It's a monster. But most of all, addiction is treatable. And you can help. An addictions career is all about helping people, helping them find treatment, helping them find courage. Helping them find themselves again. And sure, there are richer career paths in life you could follow. But none is noble. Or is rewarding. To yourself, and to those around you. Just imagine. You could help save my job. My family. My community. My life. You could help save me. You could help. Help. Help change our world. Consider an addiction's career today. You could provide hope. You could transform lives. You could make a difference. Imagine who you could save. All right. Um, so one of the things that I really like about the video and why I decided to, to show it is it kind of comes off of, uh, you know, kind of uh, backs up to like the discussion we were having when we were doing our introductions or, you know, the, the question on the previous slide, like, why are we here? What are we, what are we doing? The, uh, or what do we want to do, right? And, you know, as I said earlier, uh, before this recording started, that, um, you know, many of us come here because we really do want to help people. Um, we're not going to get rich doing this. This is really about, you know, one human being helping another and um, being the best that we can be doing that. The other thing that I really like about this video is that these are actual uh, addiction professionals um, and they come from a wide range, right, of, of life experiences. Um, there's great diversity. Um, and I think that that's really important to highlight as well. As we move and, and work with clients, we're going to encounter that diversity as well. And throughout the semester, I'm going to be talking about, um, you know, uh, cross-cultural sensitivities and, um, you know, examining our own biases um, and, uh, you know, challenging us to um, take a culturally competent stance as well um, as we go, as we move forward. Um, so the other thing that I really kind of want to start off with tonight as well, and you're going to see this in the homework, um, you're going to have to define evidence-based. And so I wanted to have a, a, you know, present this as part of the lecture uh, right off the bat. Um, so what is evidence-based practice? So in the book, um, in the textbook, you can look it up. 
I encourage you to do this. Um, uh, it says that it's an activity that is based on the best available research in context of the care of the patient characteristics, culture, and preferences. And yes, I read that directly because I think it's important to actually read the direct quote, right? Um, and I put down here a, a Venn diagram in the lower right hand um, corner to also kind of demonstrate what the Institute of Men Medicine also suggests regarding the best evidence, clinical expertise, and patient values. Um, and in the middle of all of that is where EBP is, is uh, met, right? And so what do we mean by clinical expertise? Well, part of, part of that is why you're in school now. You're in school to learn techniques, um, different, you know, varying ways of, um, uh, well, you're learning the disease model. You're learning about law and ethics. In this class, you're going to be learning about what evidence-based is as we go through. You're also going to be learning on about treatment planning and group counseling and individual counseling. We'll touch on that, but you also have individual classes for that um, as well. So you're going to get a little bit more in-depth um, practice there as well. And so clients come to us because of our expertise, because of our training, right? That's why they come to us. Um, the other thing is the best research available, right? So what is the evidence? So I'll give you an example. So cognitive behavioral therapy, uh, shorthand CBT, as in Tom, um, Cognitive behavioral therapy is an evidence-based practice for actually lots of different um, concerns than an individual might have, but really around substance use and substance use disorders, right? Another evidence-based uh, model is motivational interviewing, which I'm sure that you've heard of. Um, and if not, you'll be writing a paper on that in the next month on the trans-theoretical model of change which is all about uh, motivational interviewing. And there's been a lot of research around motivational interviewing. So the evidence is, is what works um, and what doesn't work. Um, the other thing about evidence-based uh, is, um, I want you to begin to think about what evidence-based thinking is. So when we're approaching a client's situation, right? What is what is the best techniques that's going to uh, help this client make progress, move through the stages of change, um, and meet their individual goals, which is kind of like the last part. What are the patient's values? Or on the Venn diagram, it says the patient's preferences. You know, in law and ethics, for example, one of the, um, one of the tenets is, of counseling is, is that we respect the autonomy of individuals to make their own decisions. And so a patient, and I'm using the word patient here, um, just clinically, but our clients, um, you know, they do have preferences uh, and they need to be taken into account when we're doing uh, treatment planning, case management, uh, and, and those kinds of things. So something else with um, evidence base that I kind of want you guys to, to do, um, and I'm asking this question, it's on the bottom of the screen, and I just want you to think about it, because you're actually going to have to do this on your homework, but can you define and summarize evidence based in your own words? It's great to have the quote, and I think the quote's important, but one of the ways that we learn best is when we take information, and we read it, and we're uh, and of course, I didn't put everything that's in the book on the slide, just kind of summarized it, right? But when you're reading the textbook, taking that information and then trying to summarize it in your own words. And in doing that, um, that's actually a, a very helpful learning technique. So I want you to be thinking about how can I summarize and define evidence-based and evidence-based thinking, because that'll be another term you're going to learn in the book. Um, in your own words, right? So evidence-based, that's one of those things I'm gonna be really pounding, pounding um, 
this semester, and you've probably already heard it in other classes. And if you haven't, you will be, right? Depending on where you are in the, um, in the AODS class path, right? Um, some of you are at different, different places. So another thing that, that the chapter one talks about is higher education for addiction counselors. Um, and so I kind of want to like hit on that tonight. And based on the time, uh, this is actually probably the last slide I'll be able to get to and we'll pick up um, next, next time. So this will be a short part one. Um, but the history of the evolution of addiction counseling came through with some actually some some research. Um, there was a research study that was conducted in 1986. It's the Birch and Davis study. And um, this is where, if you've ever heard of the 12 core functions and the national standards of 315 hours being required for training for addiction counseling to be considered um, entry level, be able to be certified and start actually practicing with clients there was this 315 hour standard, right? And the problem with 15, 315 hours is it's really kind of hard to translate into college credits, for example. So for example, here at City College, if you are um, going through the AODS program and you're getting the certificate, that means you have to have 36 college credits in order to earn the certificate. And that doesn't really translate well to 315 hours. So you can already begin to see how the national standard doesn't really work well today. The other thing to think about this is, um, and what I'm really advocating for here, and what the book is really talking about, is the need to really examine what education requirements there are um, and are needed for addiction counselors. So you're looking at Birch and Davis study, great study um, at the time. That's, that's what helped to try to uh, propel us into um, uh, trying to raise the standards for addiction counseling, um, but it was before the internet. <laughs> so why would we still be like kind of like focused on that uh, uh, today, right? And some of this stuff actually came up from starting in the 19th, late 70s. And of course, Birch and Davis was in the mid 80s. Um, so in 1997, uh, that's when TAP 21 came out and it tried to uh, create these um, competencies. There's 123 competencies that were originally designed um, for addiction counseling, and it's listed in the TAP 21. I don't know if you've ever seen the TAP 21, but it goes through each of the, of the um, uh, not the 12 core functions. Oh, shoot. All right. Uh, tip of my tongue, it's not coming, uh, but we'll hit it in a, in a slide in a minute. Eight, eight practice dimensions? Yes, that's it. Thank you very much. For some reason, that was going out of my head. In a couple of slides, we actually have a comparison between the practice dimensions and the core functions, but for some reason it was just gone. Um, but that's where a lot of this uh, came from. The other thing that, that is, was determined was is that they really were moving toward college degrees, becoming preferred over the original 315 our national standard. So in other words, what they're saying is, is they're really wanting to increase the um, level of education. So earlier, one of the students um, asked, and we kind of had a discussion about, you know, is there a four-year AODS program? And here in California, there's only the one that I am aware of at Cal State Fullerton. Um, but everywhere else, it's either 36 units, um, or a two-year associate in science degree. And that's it, that's the max. 
Um, so here's, here's a picture of the TAP21. You actually used to be able to order this and they would send it to you for free. Um, now you, you can download it. And the TAP21 was actually just recently updated, revised in, uh, I believe, 2015. So um, uh, if you're interested, you can go onto the SAMHSA website and you can actually download uh, a copy of the addiction counseling competencies. Um, <coughs> and this I kind of said earlier, and we've already been talking about evidence-based, but I kind of want to talk about competencies here uh, and end with competency. So what is the definition of competency, right? Um, it's a rhetorical question. I'm about to answer it for you, right? So to be competent basically means is that we have the knowledge, we have the skills, um, we have the attitudes, um, and we have the, um, oh, the uh, 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 strengths. That's the other word that I was trying to think of. Uh, the strengths to accomplish a certain task or um, to do something successfully. And in this case, what are we talking about doing successfully? What we're talking about is counseling, right? And so whenever you hear the word competencies, that's kind of what I want you to think of. And so the top 21 has 123 competencies that underlie all the knowledge, skills, and attitudes um, that research has determined are needed for effective counseling work, uh, for effective professionals, right? And these are known as KSAs. So anytime you hear KSAs, um, that is what we are referring to, knowledge, skills, and attitudes. Um, this slide is a little out of date because it was revised in 2000, but then it was again revised in 2015, uh, which is what I just explained. Um, and it's been repackaged and presented in new formats several times. Um, so the most recent would be in uh, 2015. Um, so here's what we're going to do. Before I get into the history of the competencies, it doesn't make sense to start this part. So we're gonna pick this up at the next class. And um, what I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording. This will be posted as part one, and it looks like it'll be about a 20 minute video. Each night when I do class, we will be, I will be recording and um, whatever the official lecture is will be posted for your review. That way, if you're having internet difficulty, you get kicked out, something happens, um, uh, at least you have a backup that you can kind of catch up. Doesn't mean you'll necessarily have to listen to the whole thing. You might only have to listen to the part that you missed. So I kind of wanted to say that. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and stop the recording and then we will, uh, before we close, we'll address some questions and answers, do a little bit of housekeeping and um, go on from there.